Thank you. Good morning, church. Like Pastor Jeff said, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Grant Glover, and I work with the college students here at PCBC. If we haven't gotten a chance to meet yet, uh, Pastor Jeff and I will be outside after the service, and I would love to get a chance to meet any of you. And I'm so glad to be with you in this room this morning, since about roughly 30 years ago, my parents actually got married in here. So I guess you can say I kind of got my start here on this stage all those years ago. And so anyways, I'm just excited to get a chance to continue on in our study of 1 Timothy that we've been doing this summer. But before we dive in, I want to share with you one of my favorite news stories of all time, and it happened a few months ago. In early January, GameStop, a company that sells video games, was at a stock price of about $18. And for those of you who don't know, GameStop has not been doing well these past few years. They're not doing well financially. They have been struggling as a company. But people around my age feel nostalgic about it because we loved to go there as kids. And so a community of about 6 million young people on this website called Reddit, which is kind of like a forum for people who have similar interests, banded together in order to resurrect their beloved GameStop. They noticed that all of these hedge funds had been betting against it and recognized that if they could band together and buy stock at the same time, they can shoot the price up. And they did. It went from a price of $18 all the way to $483, making it worth more than Tyson and General Mills. And it's amazing. This company wasn't worth anything, but a bunch of kids in their pajamas, in their mom's basement, banded together to ruin the financial world. (laughs) Unbelievable. (laughs) Now, naturally, this upset a lot of people because a lot of people lost money and they viewed this as manipulating the market. And what we saw was that more traditional investors, who (laughs) the Redditors lovingly nicknamed the suits, saw this as unfair and that they wanted, they didn't want to see this happen again. And so what we saw was this divide emerge among investors between younger generations and older generations. Older generations, again nicknamed the suits, like to invest in assets that have value. You know, companies that make money and actually provide good products. Now, that is probably the smart thing to do, but that is boring at least according to people my age. Younger investors, retail investors, are looking for to buy a one-way ticket to the moon by whatever means necessary. And if that means buying GameStop or AMC or cryptocurrencies, they'll do whatever it takes to try to buy in on the next big thing. So as you can see, quite the disparity in approach. And we talk a lot about division in our modern society, but one of the more underrated divisions we're witnessing is the generational divide. As Pastor Jeff has mentioned before, research shows that a teenager in America has more in common with a teenager in Germany than they do with older generations in America. And that's because our Western culture has become highly individualistic. We tend to hang around people who think like us, and that usually means being around people our own age. And what tends to happen is that younger generations will think older ones are outdated in their thinking, and older generations will think the younger ones have just gone off the rails. And it's not just that way in society, it's also that way in the church. And that's a problem, isn't it? We have older churches and younger churches. Is that the way it's supposed to be? How are we supposed to bring older and younger generations of Christians together? And how are we to relate to our older or younger coworkers, family, and friends? Our goal today is to determine what the basis is for cooperating with one another in an era of individualism, to see how we get out of our own little world to bridge generational gaps. The essential question we will answer is this. How is Christianity supposed to look different than our current world's individualism? 
We will do that by looking through, we'll find our answer in 1 Timothy, and we've been going through this series this summer talking about how 1 Timothy is all about paradox, that God's kingdom is the reverse of the way the world works. And we will see that again today in 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 16 when it comes to generations. And we will look at three things to answer our question of how we are to look different. Training, cooperating, and centering. Training, cooperating, and centering. So first, before we get into how we should be cooperating, we will look at how we should be training. You can look down with me at 1 Timothy 4, 7, or in the words should appear on the screen. And Paul tells Timothy in verse 7 that you should train yourself for godliness. And that word there for godliness is used to talk about reverence or respect for God, much like you would have of your parents. And so Paul is telling Timothy to train himself to deepen his relationship with God. Now, when you first look at that, it can look like he's telling Timothy to simply work harder in his faith, to simply try harder to be a better person. And that's often how we can view our Christian lives, that we're supposed to clean ourselves up to God and simply be better people by working and trying harder. We think, if I would just go to church more, if I would pray more, read my Bible more, then I would finally be the kind of Christian God wants me to be. Let me tell you what you will find if that's how you view your spiritual life. You will often find that you have a lingering suspicion that God is disappointed with you. If you're God, you will constantly find yourself questioning, am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Is he satisfied with my effort? Effort. If your godliness is based on your effort by itself, then guess what all of these religious activities become? Work. They become tasks. They would simply be a way for you to try to gain God's approval by the way you're behaving so that he will no longer be frustrated with you. Is this how you view your Christian life, that you are just simply trying to work so that God will no longer be disappointed in you? Paul offers a better way. The word for train comes from the Greek word gymnazo, which is where we get our word for gymnasium. So Paul is telling Timothy to work out for his relationship with God. And if that's true, then it can't be based simply on your effort. How is that? Well, think about going to the gym. Here's what you don't do. You don't go to every machine, put it on the heaviest weight, and then say, if I just try really hard, I'm going to get stronger. What's going to happen? You're going to go to every machine, put it on the heaviest weight, strain really hard, get hyped up with your music, push really hard, and find that you won't be able to do it. And then you'll move on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And the same goes with our Christian faith. What's going to happen is you're going to wear yourself out if you keep on trying to take on a weight that you can't handle. Just simply saying, I'm going to be a better person by trying really hard will lead to nothing but failure and guilt because you're trying to be carrying something that you can't and you will never achieve the goal that you're striving for. So your effort needs to be accompanied by direction, by a trainer so that you can actually go somewhere. But what's our trainer? Well, Paul tells us actually, he gives us a hint in verse six if you'll look with me where he says that Timothy is trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that he has followed. The, good word, the words of faith and of the good doctrine he's followed is very clear what that's referring to when you look at 1 Timothy as a whole. It's the gospel. That is what our training is all about. You are to be trained daily by the gospel of grace. Only the gospel can truly train you. It's not that you don't have to try or that God is saying that you don't put forth any effort. It's that we need the right trainer to tell us what to do. We tend to think of the gospel that, as that Jesus lived a perfect life, died for my sins, rose again, and now I pray a prayer and that means I get to go to heaven when I die. And that all may be true, but the gospel is actually bigger than that. And it's news that shapes your life now. But 
what about this news trains the way we live our lives now? Well, it's a simple, profound, and maybe unexpected answer. It's grace. The gospel proclaims the radical grace of God where God forgives and accepts people before they do anything and based on nothing that they have done. And in fact, he loves people unconditionally with no strings attached in spite of all of the terrible things they continue to do. It can be so hard for us to understand this kind of grace because we are so used to having to perform to gain other people's acceptance and perhaps we try to perform to gain God's acceptance too. This is a foreign concept to us. This grace is different. And it is this idea of grace which we have a hard time truly picturing That is what trains us daily. But in what way does this grace train us? It means that your whole life is lived entirely in response to God's love, not to earn it. So instead of going to church because you feel guilty for how you've been living, you go, grace teaches you that you go because you're grateful for how you've been forgiven. Instead of avoiding lust because you're afraid of judgment, Grace teaches you that you're forgiven of that one, and that grace teaches you that you are to enjoy God simply more. Whenever you feel that God is frustrated with you, grace tells you that he is not disappointed with you, that he has loved you and accepted you already unconditionally, and that can never change. Whenever you mess up, grace tells you that you do not have to clean yourself up for him because he has already made you clean perfectly. Instead of allowing what your boss thinks of you or your spouse, or your friends, or your kids, grace teaches you that you do not need to seek other people's approval because you have received perfect approval from God, your creator, already. Do you see why we need to remind ourselves of the gospel? We forget that we're forgiven, that we're loved, and that there's nothing we can do to change it. That's why the gospel has got to train you to teach you how to really live and relate to God. It's got to challenge you. And that's why Paul uses the word for gymnasium. Part of the job of the trainer is to tell you what your flaws are, what muscles you need to train, and what equipment you need to get there. Sometimes you need a trainer to come and tell you to stop hitting the bench press every day and occasionally work in some abs in there. It's summertime. To go to the gym is to confront your flaws, to see them, and to train them. And that's what the gospel is for us. It will show you your flaws and your failures, but then it will tell you that those don't define you anymore and you have something greater to live for. We need this training because we don't live like it's true. How often do you find yourself singing of grace on Sunday morning, and then by Tuesday afternoon you are racked with guilt and shame? How often do you find yourself concerned with what other people think of you or concerned with what God thinks of you? Through training, grace has to go from just a mere belief and it has to seep deep within you to completely change the way you view yourself, God, and other people. And that means you're going to have to argue with yourself every day. That whenever thoughts that are not true come up here, you have to remind yourself that grace is real, that you really are loved and forgiven no matter what you do. You are not defined by who you are and what you do, but God's love and acceptance of you. So where do you need to remind yourself of grace? What areas of your life are you wearing yourself out trying to be good enough? Now, you might be thinking, Grant, that sounds intense. Why go to all this work? Because training is kind of hard. There's good reason why. Let me show you. Look back down in 1 Timothy 4. And if you'll look down in verse 8, it says, While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Then down in verse 10, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God. Paul is pointing out something profound here. While going to the gym and exercising is certainly beneficial, its results won't last. No matter how ripped you are, no matter how swole you get, 
One day you're going to age, and that is going to fade away. And the same goes for every other thing we look for and strive after on earth. Whatever we are striving to achieve, whatever you try to base your life on, it will not last. So you will have no hope. But the same is not true of God's love and acceptance of you. His grace lasts forever, and it can't be taken away. So that means if you base your life, your worth, and your value on the grace God has shown you, you will have true hope. Let me show you how. If training in the gospel leads to a greater hope than bodily training, then that changes the way we view our bodies. Too many of us are caught up in how people view our bodies, and we're setting our hope in looking different one day so that people will finally find us attractive. Do you find yourself looking at pictures of you and often feeling disappointment? When you look in the mirror every morning, do you guilt yourself by what you see? Are you struggling with the way you eat? Are you always insecure about your height, about how you look compared to others? Are you always trying to dress a certain way so that people will finally see you as attractive? Grace has an answer for that, friends. Your hope is not in how you look. Your attributes do not matter anymore. You do not have to strive for approval for your looks because in the gospel of grace, God has called you beautiful, wonderful, and lovely already. And it's unconditional. It can't be taken away from you. And it will always last unlike anything that you'll find out in the world. And that is why we must train in the gospel of grace daily to remind ourselves that that is what is true about us. So, that is what the training is all about. And when we understand that, it will show us how to cooperate. You can look down with me again at 1 Timothy, where you'll see in 1 Timothy 4, 12, Paul says to let no one despise you for your youth. You might be thinking, now we know why Grant is teaching this week. <laughs> but there is something profound here and it's a principle that people would have considered shocking in that culture. You see, in Ephesus, where Timothy was living, they were a Greco-Roman society, which means that they had an honor-shame culture. And we're not familiar with those because in the West, we're not really built like that. But in a Greco-Roman world, like Ephesus was, the honor-shame culture meant that everybody in the community had a certain level of honor based on attributes about them. It meant that if your honor was determined by who you were born to, what gender you were, and how old you were, and how much honor you had in the eyes of the community determined what you could or could not do, what functions you could go to, what things you could lead, or even where you would sit at the dinner table. And so what's interesting and very relevant to our passage is that age was the one of the highest, if not the highest measure of honor in the Roman world. The word for youth there that describes Timothy, we don't know exactly how old he was, but that word communicates that he was either in his 20s or 30s, which by Roman standards would call him a young man, and he would then have less honor attached to his name than elders. And so you can listen to one Roman author. His name was Aulus Gellius. He lived around 200 AD, and he writes this. Among the earliest Romans, as a rule, neither birth nor wealth was more highly honored than age. But older men were reverenced by their juniors almost like gods and like their own parents. When I was in the Philippines after I graduated college, I was there doing mission work, I ran into and encountered one of these honor-shame cultures up close. There are lots of cultural practices in the Philippines that you have to do there to befriend people, which often involve me eating some nasty food in people's homes to not reject their hospitality. And I will spare you those details so you can go enjoy your lunch. But one of the more unique practices that you have to do is that when you meet someone older than you, you have to assign to them an honorific title to show them honor for their age. So for example, if I met an older female, I would either call her ate, which means older sister, or nanai, which means something like mother. 
And as you can imagine, it was hard sometimes to guess who was Ate and who was Nanai. <laughs> and you've run into this situation where you're sitting there thinking, is that, is that her mom or grandma? Same thing there. But what's funny is that it's the exact opposite of what you would find here. People would rather be referred to as older than younger. I was told that if I was between the two, older sister or mother, to go with mother and to call that person that. I don't recommend trying that here. But that's what their culture was like. They wanted honor for their age. And when I would run into high school students, they, I was older than them, so they had to show me honor. And so what they would do beyond calling me like older brother is they would take my hand and like put it on their forehead like this to show me honor. I kind of liked it. <laughs> it's it's kind of fun. But that is what an honor shame culture is all about. People of older age have more honor to their name. So what is Paul really telling Timothy? When he tells them to not, look, to not let people look down on him for his age, that is honor language. He's telling Timothy to not find honor in his age, which is the opposite of how he was raised. How could his cultural norms be flipped like that? It's because of what we talked about with the training. Because Timothy has been trained by the gospel, he knows that his honor has nothing to do with his age. In the gospel, God has already approved of him, which means he does not have to worry about how other people view his honor. He is free. So that, this means the gospel has now leveled the church in Ephesus where now everybody is of equal honor. The Roman world has now been turned upside down. Everybody is a child of God by grace, so now they're able to work together without worrying about status or social distinctions. So this answers our question. How is Christianity supposed to look different from the world's individualism? The gospel of grace allows generations to fully cooperate together. Because neither older nor younger people are of any more worth, value, honor, or status, multiple generations are able to respond to grace together. It means that in Christianity, your age does not, by itself, determine your function in the church. So when you look at all, at all of Paul's commands, following that, following verse 12, he's not telling Timothy to earn status. He's not telling Timothy to earn honor in the eyes of the elders, but to simply live out the freedom he now has to lead because his honor doesn't define him anymore. It's why in verse 14, he has Timothy ministering to the elders with his gifts and the elders ministering to Timothy with his prayer. They are now able to cooperate together. And because of grace, they can minister to each other in different ways. And no kind of cooperation existed like this in the Roman world at that time. And the gospel has turned things upside down. The gospel is bigger than Timothy's culture. And it's bigger than ours. Now, since we live in modern America, we don't have the same kind of issues that Ephesus did. Nobody here has more honor based on age alone so how does this apply to us? Well, while we don't typically look down on people for age purposes, we do, there is this new trend to look down on people based on ideals and worldviews that we tend to get in our own tribes because we're individualistic and we hang out with people our age and we, older generations will either look down on younger generations or, older, or younger generations will look down at older generations. What we are witnessing is people looking down on ways of thinking. So how can we learn about different generations cooperating? Well, if the gospel is bigger than culture, then we know that our way of thinking is not the most important thing about us. If the gospel of grace is true, then there is not one way of doing church. And that is how we cooperate. You see, if Paul tells Timothy that grace means that both young and old leaders are now of equal honor and are equally valid, then that means that different cultural expressions of church are now also equally valid. And that is why Christianity is the most culturally diverse religion in the world. According to a Pew Research study, 80% of Muslims inhabit essentially two geographic regions of the world. 99% of Hindus and Buddhists live in Southeast Asia. And what about Christianity? 
It is almost equally spread across North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Does that surprise you? Do you know that this Sunday more people will attend church in Sub-Saharan Africa than they will here in America? How can Christianity be so diverse? How can we be so inclusive? It's because the gospel is not tied to culture. Christianity is not tied to one culture. It's bigger than all of them. And it means that for an African to become a Christian, they don't have to give up what makes them African to become a Christian. They don't have to be westernized. They just have to believe the gospel. That's it. And then they then respond to the gospel of grace in their own culture, abandoning some practices and holding on to others. They simply just live in response to the gospel. And if this is true, that that means there is no one right way to do church. And this is how we can cooperate. It simultaneously allows some things in church to stay the same for younger generations while other things in the church changing for older generations. Because the gospel is about grace and not working to please God by what we do, there's freedom for flexibility. While some things in the church are necessary, like worship, prayer, and teaching, and Paul commands all of those, the way we do those things can change as we move culture to culture and generation to generation. So how can this look practically? Well, in America, there's currently a divide in religious beliefs among people of different ages. If you are ages 65 and up, 70% of people in America believe in God, as compared to 51% of those 18 to 29, 70 to 51. While 48% of those 65 and up attend church weekly in America, only 27% of those 18 to 29 do, 48 to 27. What does this tell you? My generation needs help. We need your help. I was born in one of the last years of millennials, so all of my friends are in that generation. And as college minister, I hang out with a lot of students in Generation Z. That's where I spend the bulk of my time. And they see the world a lot differently than other generations, and that leads to the way that they view church, too. And I don't have time to go into all the details this morning, but I will explain one key element of how to reach people my age and younger, and that's authenticity. We desire to be around and hear from people who are fully authentic, who hold nothing back about themselves. It's why we don't watch sports news channels like ESPN and Fox Sports, or really any other news channel, because the journalists on there seem to be performing and have some kind of agenda. It's why we listen to podcasts and watch YouTube videos, where people there are able to be fully authentic, fully themselves, and they can really speak what's on their mind. And the same kind of thinking goes for church. Younger people are looking for an authentic church experience where they feel like they can just be themselves and they don't have to clean themselves up or put on a face to come to church. That's why younger people prefer more casual settings and that's why they're often intimidated by churches. They often feel like church is a place for people who have it all together, even though we all know that's not true. So to reach younger people, it's going to be really hard, really difficult to bring them into how we've always done church, since they are looking for authentic experiences out with their friends in the communities they live. And if they're concerned with authenticity, that means some of our church practices will have to change and look just slightly different. So how can this look practically for you? Two things. First, whatever your age be flexible on your idea of church in response to grace. We need some tradition to keep us grounded, but we need some innovation to reach the ever-changing culture we're experiencing. So for my younger friends, some things need to stay the same. For my more mature friends, some things need to change. What do you need to be flexible on in response to grace? to allow the generations to fully cooperate together. Second, seek to spend time with people of different generations in your workplace and family. The reason for the generational division is that people really aren't spending time and listening to others who think a little differently than them. Let's change that. Take some interns out to lunch this week and enjoy just spending time and hanging out with them. Call your older relatives and just fill them in on what's going on in your world. Plan an event 
a joint event between your small group and another from a different generation, and again, just enjoy spending time talking with one another. To reflect the idea that grace, that grace brings us together, we have to spend time with and listen to people who think differently than us. So because of the gospel, we can cooperate. Now, when you look at verse 16, you see Paul tell Timothy that by doing these things that he could save both himself and his hearers. And that can raise a question in your head. Is Paul telling Timothy he can save himself? Of course not. And you can tell by looking at an earlier verse in the passage. And this will be our last and very brief point today. The centering. Look back in 1 Timothy 4.10 where it says that we have set our hope on a living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The savior, of course, is referring to to Jesus. So Paul is telling Timothy not to save himself, but to simply respond to what the Savior has done and what he has accomplished. So for us then, our training and our cooperating are centered on Jesus' work. Like Timothy, Jesus would have been considered a young man in the Roman world, being 30 when he began his ministry, and he did not live a long, full life to achieve honor. He was crucified at the age of 33 years old. And this is the reason Timothy did not need to fear being dishonored by Romans because Jesus took on the ultimate dishonor for his sake. In Roman culture, there was nothing more dishonorable to your name than to be crucified and killed like a criminal. So that means Jesus took on the ultimate dishonor, death, for our sake so that we might receive the ultimate honor, life with God because of what he did. He was treated like a criminal so that we could be treated like children of God. His death allowed our sins to be forgiven and for us to be unconditionally accepted by grace and receive the unconditional love we have always been desiring. His work was all that was necessary to give us grace and to bring the generations together. It's because of what he did that we cooperate because he sacrificed himself for all so we sacrifice some of our wants for the sake of others. All he wants and all he asks is that you respond to his grace, to receive his grace in whatever way that looks like for you. Seek to cling to what he did more than anything else in the world, since his work is the only way we can find what we're searching for, and the generations will never be the same as a result. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word for your goodness and your grace. Let it train us daily. Let us be reminded of who you say we are and not who we think we are. Let us respond to what you've done, that we are not defined by what we do, but we are defined only by what you have done for us on our behalf. And that you would stir in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would love those who look different than us and think different than us. And that you would bring us together, that the gospel might flourish in our church, it might flourish in younger generations, that people would just come to see how good and gracious and kind you are. That we would look at your death as what defines us, what you did for us is all that we need, and that we would just respond to that grace. In your name I pray, amen.